Hi, I'm Ken Fisher. Welcome to the 18th season of Citywide. My guest on this edition of Citywide is Ed Ott, Distinguished Lecturer at CUNY's Murphy Institute for Worker Education and Labor Studies. That is a mouthful. That is a mouthful. So, it's also part of the School of Professional Studies. It, it, so I, I don't want our viewers to think that, that you are merely an academic. You are, in fact, a practitioner, the former executive director of the Central Labor Council, political organizer extraordinaire over the years. Um, now. Uh, on a college faculty. Yes. Um, how did you get into labor, let alone labor studies? Well, yeah, I grew up in the Bronx, working class kid. Um, so unions were part of the conversation. I went to work in a hospital after I got out of the service. Uh, it was non-unionized. It was actually the largest voluntary hospital in the country without a union, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. Got involved with the union there, and um, I've been beating this drum ever since. So is the state of the union sound? No. No, nothing's sound. The whole world has changed. Um, I think all the institutions of the world have had to adjust. And unions, uh, in fact, what they try to do is preserve what people have. So when you get into one of these periods where everything is changing, the whole economy is reorganized worldwide, uh, we have, we're in an adjustment period. That has political ramifications, um, not just in New York, but around the, around the world. But let's talk a little bit about the election. So okay. we're in a week where... Um, Democrats um, moved Bill de Blasio into the forefront of the mayoral campaign, taking uh, people somewhat by, uh, by surprise. And my sense of it was that while you can point to strategic decisions, tactical decisions, how he presented himself as a candidate, how uh, Christine Quinn or John Liu or, or Bill Thompson presented them as candidates, at the core of de Blasio's um, uh, success was the fact that there's a great deal of, of dissatisfaction with elites, with, with, that even people who were doing well in the Bloomberg economy got tired of being told what to do, and even more than that, frustrated by a sense that um, the game was rigged against them and they were just tired of it. it, it Am I right? Is, is that what he was able to tap into? Well, I think there's an element of his vote that, that will reflect that. But when we say the word elites, you know, you, we have to remember also he's going to get some support from elites. You start looking at the upper middle class of the city, he's getting his fair share of votes there. What I think the vote showed was that it's possible now to put together, cobble together, which is what he did, a progressive coalition in every constituency that are issue driven. And some of it is, yes, we feel like the rich guys have gotten everything their way for the last 12, maybe even 20 years, and it's our turn. But I, I think it's a little more complicated than that. If you think about it, de Blasio wins the black vote. He wins the women's vote, he wins the gay vote. And what that says to me is one, identity politics isn't enough for a candidate anymore. You have to be there on the issues that people care about. So Chris loses her district to de Blasio. Um, that's kind of stunning, but it's an issue-driven district. It's the west side of Manhattan, it's Chelsea. Uh, and I think that what he's shown now is you're not gonna be able to flash your ethnicity or your race and expect that you're gonna get 90% of the vote of a given constituency. He taps into John Liu's vote. He, he brings him down 15 points in districts when the last time John Liu ran, he was winning that overwhelmingly because he, uh, he was John Liu, and now it wasn't enough. So I think it's an interesting vote. Uh, whether or not it can be consolidated, is there a progressive democratic wing of the party in the city that's going to stand on issues going forward? We'll, we'll find out. 
So let's talk about what it means to be a progressive in New York City today, because um, there are certain certain issues, uh, uh, women's rights, uh, uh, gay rights, um, that were defining issues 10, 15 years ago. They're sort of part of the baseline politics for everybody uh, today. Right. So what is it that makes a, a progressive a progressive in New York today? I, I think economic issues are going to come to the forefront. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of economic insecurity in the city. Some of it's reflective of a new economy that people are still adjusting to. Like one of the fastest growing organizations in the city is the Freelancers Union. And you know that's a recognition that people with certain skills are going to be offered job, uh, offered work, but not jobs. We, we've had Sarah Horowitz. Uh, the, yeah, the she, on she's terrific. Show. Tell people what the Workers' Union is. Uh, the, the Freelancers, freelancers Union is. really represents people who um, are working uh, with a temporary work, but often with skills. They, they represent uh, nannies, but they also represent people who might be working as graphic artists. Uh, they'll be hired for a particular project, and they will move on. They don't have pensions. They don't have health care. Uh, they often are pursuing money because people owe it to them who, that they perform tasks for. And the freelancers union, they attempt to deal with all those questions and provide uh, affordable health insurance. But they're not really in a position to bargain terms and conditions. They're not looking to. And, and I think it's something that the traditional unions have had to recognize. And I think employers are going to have to recognize. New forms of organization are emerging to attempt to deal with some of the impacts that the new economy has on their lives. And they're not seeking collective bargaining agreements in the traditional sense. They're seeking to uh, uh, solve problems um, and assist people in both finding work and securing their payment. Uh, but they're not looking to sit down with an enterprise and say, we're going to negotiate for 500 employees the wages, hours, and working conditions under which they'll perform. So let, let's talk about economic issues from a progressive point of view. Uh, Bill de Blasio unabashedly, unashamedly calling for what in a academic setting would be the redistribution of wealth. Tax the wealthy more, provide additional so social services for uh, uh, lower income uh, lower income families. Yeah. Um, was he that different from what Christine Quinn had done with some of her policies in the council or what any of the other candidates were talking about? Or was it just that he articulated that message well, more clearly? I, I, well, a little bit of both. Um, I think that if you're going over the record, when he was a council member, uh, there's going to be a lot of similar votes that they took. But as you know, by the time stuff comes to a vote in the council, all the controversy has been worked out. So the vote's not always reflective of what people really believe. Uh, in his case, I think he did recognize that he could tap into something. We've been lectured at for over 20 years about reducing the top marginal tax rates, uh, making sure that Wall Street wasn't abused by, say, a stock transfer tax or any of that. Meantime, people are looking at their own tax bill and saying, I'm paying too much or I'm paying a lot. I don't mind paying, but I want everybody to pay a fair share. I think he tapped into that. Now, whether or not that can be demonstrated in reality, you know, one of the things about the way he talked about raising tax on the wealthy, it was to solve a particular problem. And, and you know this from your time in the council. Legislators uh, and mayors, they don't like dedicated tax streams. Right. So, you know, how that gets worked out going forward is going to be very interesting. The other thing is since the 70s, the mayor of the city doesn't control enough revenues. So you can talk about taxes. The political fight for that is, well, first you've got to become mayor. Uh, and then you got to figure out how you convince people in Albany to go along with you. So uh, we're a long way before um, some of these problems are solved. But I do think uh, he, he demonstrated in the Democratic primary that there is a real concern that the middle class in particular is carrying the burden and they want some of it lifted. You and I had a conversation some years ago. We were talking about a, a particular uh, national community organizing group um, had some troubles later, but they were particularly strong in New York, right. ACORN. Right. And what you said to me was that they were a, 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 a poverty organization. They were an organization that was... An anti-poverty organization. An anti, no, no, no. Actually, what you said was that they were an organization that was about 
trying to get resources for pe poor people. Yeah. They weren't necessarily an organization that was trying to get people out of poverty, right. um, which was more what unions uh, were organized right. uh, uh, to do. The Working Families Party seemed to be the, the point where those two approaches came together because it included both Acorn and its successor and a lot of the uh, progressive unions. So is the Working Families Party the most um, important political influence in the city right now? I think they're part of a piece. Uh, they're very important. But, um, you know, they have labor. They have community-based organizations. Uh, they have some uh, activist groups, environmental groups, that identify with the party. The, the strength of the Work and Family Party comes from not elections, although they're significant in elections, is that they're the only real active political party between elections that's driving issue campaigns. Uh, so they become the focus the day after election People are looking to the Work and Families Party to make these guys make good on what they said they were going to do. So, say Bill de Blasio, if he becomes mayor going forward, it's going to be the activists of the Work and Families Party said, now you said you were going to tax the rich. Let's we're holding your feet to the fire. Right. So, I, from that point of view, they have put together a pretty impressive coalition of unions, advocates for the poor, and issue advocates that are going to, they're going to hand the bill over. You got to pay. We helped. A year ago, labor was talking about picking a labor candidate. Everybody was going to come uh, together. Uh, but when push came to shove, you had the service workers, uh, hotel, 32BJ, 1199 going in various uh, directions, the construction trades going someplace else, the municipal unions going someplace else. Not one municipal union endorsed Bill de Blasio. So why wasn't there one labor uh, candidate. Well, I, I think it's reflective of, of a couple of things, not the least of which, and Anthony Weiner got in too late to be get some labor support. Everybody had already committed. But the Democratic candidates who ran for mayor were all elected officials in the city for a long time. And over that time, they all developed strong relationships with different organizations. Uh, Chris earned her endorsement from 32BJ on legislation that they cared about. 1199 and their relationship with Bill de Blasio goes back to the Dinkins administration when he was working for one of the deputy mayors, uh, Bill Lynch, who just passed. So um, they earned their support. And I think it was impossible for the labor movement in general to endorse just one candidate. They were unwilling to sever those relationships. I'm not going to name the union, but you take a significant union with a particular candidate who's always been with them. If they don't stay with them when they're making their big move, why would we trust them going forward? I also had the sense that there were at least a couple of unions that I could think of who endorsed candidates that they knew were going to lose because they're going to be somewhere else. They 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 couldn't go with the other the other candidates. That, that that could be. I mean, you get some of that. Uh, unions are like any other institution. They're going to look at the array of possibility, and they're going to do what they think is best for their organization. And in this case, their members. So yeah, there's there's a lot of different motivations. But in the end, I I think that the Democratic candidates. They all earn some labor support. And frankly, I think even if Anthony had gotten in earlier without all his personal problems, there were some unions that he had a good relationship with because when he was a congressman, he spoke up on things that they cared about down in Washington. We're going to continue our conversation with, with Ed Ott when Citywide continues right after this. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with Ed Ott from the Murphy Institute. We were talking before the break about the election, and I, I, want, I want to cover some other uh, uh, topics as well on the national level, but did the unions demonstrate muscle? Um, it was hard to tell. Campaigns, the UFT running an independent campaign for, uh, for Thompson, 1199, uh, saying that they were mostly going to concentrate on reaching their own members. Um, do they... Tell us a little bit, sort of from an insider's point of view, of, of, of what is the reality of large union political operations today? How much of it is smoke and mirrors? And to what extent, when the candidate comes into your living room every day and, and presents herself or himself, does the union endorsement actually matter to members? Smoke and mirrors in politics, I'm shocked. Um, it depends on the organization, uh, and it depends on the candidate and the targeted need. 1199 clearly um, delivered votes, significant votes, uh, and significant uh, presence for de Blasio. Uh, and you only have to look at the fact that 
uh, how much of the African American vote that they were able to organize on the ground. Uh, and deliver to the Blasio. Because right, every member is not just one vote, it's yeah. their family members. Anybody members. who thinks that happens without that effort is smoking something. Uh, for some of the other candidates, uh, look, uh, Chris it is interesting. You know, she has the in endorsement of some of the moderate unions, but the truth of the matter is that wasn't her vote. So they couldn't, in my view, uh, they'll probably kill me for this. Uh, my friends will be angry at me, but they couldn't really help her as much as 1199 could help the Blasio because where their members are located, um, a lot of them are not voting until the general. You know, you take your basic uh, blue collar worker, Staten Island white guy, uh, you know, they're not getting in the Democratic primary. They generally, if they vote at all, they vote in the general, uh, even though they're registered Democrats. Uh, but some of them, they, they did help. Uh, I do think that. Um, uh, Thompson uh, benefited from the teachers. But, you know, the teachers don't do mass mobilization on the ground door to door. They do a sophisticated uh, reach out to their, to their own members. Right. And in certain districts of the city, uh, it really shows. For instance, in council races, there are certain districts in the city where the teachers really are the only ones with anything left. Uh, because if you're in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, they're one of the few unions that have a significant number of members and retirees still in that district. So they can help you there. Uh, can they help you everywhere? No. It's also, it was interesting to me, exit polling, if it's accurate, 21% um, said education was the number one issue. Thompson, with his Board of Education background, UFT support, tried to make education the centerpiece of his campaign. But 31% of voters picked jobs and economic uh, conditions yeah. as, their, as their number one issue. And there, even though none of the candidates particularly articulated a job creation strategy, um, I think the insecurity of it is, is undercut the usefulness of having the, the teacher endorsement. Yeah, the thing that surprised me about that was that the other candidates didn't see that and didn't tap into it. Uh, de Blasio's message was clearly you know, middle class people are having a hard time. And part of the problem is that the rich have had it their way too right. much, so I'll tax them to solve this problem. Right. It clearly resonated. I don't completely get why the other campaigns didn't tap in. Well, Christine it. did to some extent. She embraced the uh, creative economy, the new young voters that are right. revitalizing neighborhoods like, uh, like Williamsburg, the Flatiron uh, uh, District. It looked kind of like the people who live, you know, constituents in, in her district. And she tried to, to, to pivot that to say that there were opportunities there in Latino neighborhoods, the South Bronx, Sunset Park, and the like. But it, it, you couldn't sum it up in a bumper sticker. There wasn't a, an easy way of, 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 uh, of saying it. It's not the same as saying it's a tale of two cities. Well, to be fair to Chris, you know, she carried the burden of being the speaker. So she spent the better part of eight years having to say no to a lot of people about a lot of things. And I, I think it catches up with her. So even among that young kind of new dynamic constituency in the city, one, they're not that tuned into the issues yet. Uh, they have their own issues. But a lot of them don't see city government as the place where their issues get solved. So I don't think it, her campaign could motivate a vote out of that. You, you talked about the stereotypical union guy. So is New York still a union city? And who, who are the union members in, in New York? Well, I'll say this about New York uh, in particular, but nationally, you cannot forget that the AFL-CIO unions and the Change to Win unions are the largest membership organizations in the United States. In New York, where we still make up a significant piece of the voting population, we're still a political force. Are we the decisive force? Not in every election. But if I wanted to be mayor of this city, I would rather have the unions with me than against me. Uh, they have resources. The, the operations of the unions have gotten more sophisticated right. in the last 20 but, years. But when we talk about the union, is, is it, 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 when, you, when you say, when you conjure up the image of a, of, a, of a union member, is that a white construction worker? Is it a um, a, a hospital orderly? No. Is it a staff analyst sitting in a, in a government office building? I'm going to plug our own study. Every Labor Day, Ruth Milkman uh, from Murphy Institute and Stephanie Lewis put out a survey of the unions both in New York and nationally. And your average union member is a woman, non-white, 
less than 20% of the union members of this city are your traditional hard hat white male. So it is the orderly, it is the administrator, it is the bookkeeper and the accountant, it is the person that makes government run, and in the private sector, it is the people who service you every day in the buildings of Manhattan and Brooklyn that you walk in and out of. It is extraordinarily diverse by occupation, but it is big and it is increasingly well organized. But the number of union members, absolute number of union members in New York City is probably at a, an all-time low. What is causing that? Is it the fact that working conditions for most people really aren't that bad? Is It can't just be that employers no, have gotten I mean, more No, I mean, if you look at what happened, I mean, this is what I was talking about before when the whole economy changes. We've lost, you know, over a period of 35 years, we've lost over a million manufacturing industrial blue-collar jobs. The economy shifted. The, the printing indi industry of Varick Street is, n is no longer there. The piers along the west side, which were once loaded with warehouses and active shipping, that's not even here. It's gone. Uh, all of the city's economy completely changed. The truth is, is that as we lost private sector, the public sector grew like crazy, and now we're in this period of relative stability. One thing you should keep your eye on going forward. We're organizing in the low-wage industries of the city. There's serious efforts in fast food. There's going to be some serious efforts even in retail banking. Uh, some of those numbers, when we talk in a few years, they're going to be a little bit different. Well, let's take that as an example. Walk out at fast food restaurants around the city, around the country, tremendous publicity. Didn't shut the restaurants down. The workers could only sustain being off the payroll for a day. What was the point of the exercise? Was it simply to, to get public opinion to turn against the brands? Um, certainly not the same thing as uh, workers going out to work on the docks and then you can't, you got nobody to load the uh, Look, the we ships. didn't, it, 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 what it was, it, it's, it's building. What's going to happen to the fast food industry, I'm telling you this, we're going to lay siege to the, to the fast food industry and it's going to change. We're going to change that from a place where people have low paying jobs to where they can make a decent living. It's going to take time. We didn't organize the auto industry in a year. We laid siege to it for 50 years before we break through in a significant way. The work was done in the communities among working class people. What you're seeing in the fast food industry is a flashing red sign to other workers in the industry. We're here. Stand together. Unite. We'll make change. That's what that action's about. It wasn't designed to shut down McDonald's on 42nd Street. It was designed to tell tens of thousands of restaurant workers there's hope, and it's going to happen. You alluded earlier uh, to um, uh, an um, expansion of who organized labor is uh, in the sense of non, non activities on behalf of workers that aren't necessarily about collective bargaining. Right. In some places, it's working uh, uh, worker centers, I think they're called. Um, the AFL-CIO has announced that it's considering opening its membership to, to non-labor organizations. W what's that all about? Is that because of the new economy? Is it because act of desperation? Is it the most creative thing that labor's done in 50 years? Talk to us about Short that. Short course. This is how I make my living at the university. Um, the truth of the matter is, over a period of time, the established unions achieved a certain middle class standard. As I talked before about this whole worldwide economy changes, people start moving around all over the world looking for a better life. Many of them come here, and the current mayor has been a big advocate of supporting immigrant workers and understands the city needs more workers going forward. A lot of those workers did not find a, a welcome mat out for them in the traditional unions, and they created their own forms of organization. What you're seeing now in, in California at the AFL-CIO convention is a coming together of uh, working class organizations that have built at the base and the traditional unions and saying, if we work together, we can affect both politics, policy, and organizing. And we're going to try to get over some of the barriers that were there before. I affiliated the taxi workers with the New York City Central Labor Council when I was here. They did not have a traditional collective bargaining contract. They were contract employees. We saw it coming. Um, the truth of the matter is, here in New York, we were among the first to understand that all workers belong in the labor movement. Now we're figuring out ways to, to make that an organizational reality. So Samuel Gompers famously was asked 
what does labor want? And his answer was more. Yeah, well, that's, that's the short version. And, uh, what does labor want on today? On the wall up at the Murphy Institute at the School of Professional Studies, more schools, more jobs, more justice. That's what he was talking about, and it's in that speech. And everybody who's watching this show should go look up Gomper's speech where he says more and read it. Bring a box of tissues. If you had one thing that you wanted to say to our viewers, what would that be? Um, look, assumptions that were there in the past, the whole world has changed. What you're seeing right now is everybody, including the business community, having to adjust to new realities. And these realities are going to continue to change. Technology drives them. The world's a much smaller place. And people are moving all over the globe. The labor movement, people who think the labor movement is dead are making a fatal mistake, particularly if you're in politics. And in New York City? In New York City, we're a responsible piece of the civic structure of this city. We have always stood up for the city. We've been there to help from the 70s fiscal crisis when we put up billions to help bail it out to every situation we have always done the right thing. The biggest mistake that's going on right now is that with the municipal unions, the city government has not negotiated. Collective bargaining is the best way to solve problems in this city. My thanks to Ed Ott, Distinguished Lecturer at CUNY's Murphy Institute for Worker Education and Labor Studies. I'm Ken Fisher. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Citywide. Send your comments and suggestions to Citywide at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or contact us at cuny.tv.